distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen welcome to the regional forum that looks at refurbishment and replenishment of aging infrastructure let's take a walk down memory lane think about the time when you used to go to school the road that you would take perhaps your bus or your bike would go over a bridge and all this infrastructure was built at the time of our parents or even grandparents extreme events climate and disaster risks are now threatening that very infrastructure their structural integrity their strength their durability and operational efficiency this conversation is going to unpack the manifestation of these risks the impacts on aging infrastructure and the solutions that we need to co-develop i am delighted to invite professor richard dawson who will moderate this session professor dawson is the director of research at the school of engineering at newcastle university his research looks at the mitigation of environmental risks on catchments cities and infrastructure networks he has published over 80 papers and has been the recipient of several awards such as the lloyds science of risk prize the robert alfred carr prize he is also the lead author on the chapter on cities settlements and infrastructure for the latest assessment report of the ipcc over to you professor dawson Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here hosting this exciting session. Um, uh, and uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. So before I invite our speakers to uh, provide some more substantive talks, I thought it would be useful to just try and set the scene with a, a few slides just to uh, get us in in the mood thinking about some of the challenges of resilience and net zero together so perhaps studio if you could share my slide deck please Fantastic. Um, next slide. So here, what I wanted to get across was a sense of some of the challenges uh, and the both the sort of synergies and and um, conflicts or trade-offs, I think, that are emerging as we try to deliver both resilience to climate change and also a net zero infrastructure. that we know from the latest and indeed successive IPCC reports that uh, climate hazards are posing increasing risks to the operation of our infrastructure and one of the things that we looked at for the first time in this IPCC report was some of those systemic risks to the operation of networks and cascading risks of that result from interdependencies between sectors and perhaps nowhere is this more visible uh, than uh, as we drive towards net zero where we're seeing fundamental shifts in the role of electricity uh, moving in some places to being the dominant and in single source of energy for lots of activities and critical services and so it is absolutely crucial as we move towards this uh, decarbonization of our electricity system um that we embed climate resilience in both the power system but also our other infrastructures as well uh to ensure that we don't increase the risk of that cascading failure there are a wide range of adaptation options to achieve this but it's not necessarily a simple factor as the next slide shows if we could just move there and here what we have is a um a block graph which is showing um kind of Uh, the carbon use of our infrastructure of our urban infrastructure uh, on the left hand side the block there shows um over 50 gigatons uh, uh that 
are, are being used by developed cities in their infrastructure and a far lower proportion um, or far lower amounts being used in developing uh, world cities. And if those cities were to, um, uh, if you like, change their infrastructure, um, and uh, I hesitantly use the word upgrade to developed uh, urban uh, infrastructures that we see there, the increase in carbon emissions uh, would be substantial. If we account for all of the urban growth we anticipate over the coming decades, then what we would see is that more than a quarter of our global emissions budget to maintain global mean warming at about two degrees centigrade uh, would be encountered or would be used up just in our urban infrastructure. So this is a huge challenge. We need to, de you know, we need to change the way that we are building our infrastructure, business as usual, uh, and developed uh, nation infrastructure models are too carbon intensive. And if we just move to the next slide, which is to which is really showing the a key conclusion from the latest IPCC report around the urgency of action and intervention, and that we need to move, uh, I hope, towards that sort of greener, uh, yellow, if, if nothing else, set of pathways in the top of this figure, where um, a combination of both decarbonisation and adaptation drive change uh, in major systems like our cities, like our infrastructure, like our industry, um, towards a more sustainable development pathway. And I think the really important point is that came out of the latest IPCC report is that every action we make on infrastructure, every decision we make matters starting today. And that time frame uh, is narrowing because as we start, if we move towards a sort of a two degrees uh, global warming world, then adaptation becomes far, far, far more challenging. And in some cases, in some parts of the world, actually uh, impossible, posing an existential threat to those locations. And infrastructure has got a really key role for that. And I'm really delighted to introduce uh, our guests today who are going to provide some case studies and examples from around the world uh, as to what some of these challenges are and how they're addressing those. And so my first speaker today is Professor Satoru Nishikawa, who joined Japanese government service in 1982. He has held various positions in the Japanese government, United Nations, Tokyo Metropolitan Government, and other international organizations. In 1992, he was appointed Senior Disaster Relief Coordination Officer at UNDHA, where he coordinated international assistance to numerous disaster-stricken countries. He was appointed the executive director of Asian Disaster Reduction Center in 2001, and after resuming Japanese government service in 2004, held senior positions in the cabinet office and the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Tourism, Transport and Tourism of Japan. In the aftermath of the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, he coordinated the Japanese government technical assistance to affected uh, countries, uh, including um, uh, um, uh, 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 around the world. He was also the on-site coordinator of the Nigato Chuetsu earthquake. He hosted and coordinated the 2005 UN World Conference on Disaster Reduction. He proposed the Japanese BCP guideline and he initiated the long-term regional recovery for the Tohoku after the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. He has huge amounts of experience uh, as, as evidenced in his CV. Uh, Professor Nishikawa, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So my slide, please. Today, uh, I would like to introduce some real examples of uh, renovation of infrastructures. Today, I'm going to speak about renovation of existing dams or adaptation. Adaptation to climate change, adaptation to environmental challenges, adaptation to uh, changes in demand. Now, we have many challenges that we face in major river basins in Japan. Of course, climate change, uh, extreme floods, water shortages, aging facilities and sedimentation for dams, 
the, the river environment is always going to change, and we are facing electricity needs. Now, please take a look at this graph. It shows uh, the annual precipitation fluctuation starting from year 1900 to date. So later on, I'm going to speak about a renovation of a dam called Sameura. This Sameura Dam started construction in 1967. It's here. And as you can see from this graph, when this dam was planned, they looked at the precipitation data of the past 50 years prior to 1967. And as you can see from this graph, that was a period where the precipitation was rather stable. But after the construction, the fluctuation became bigger. Also, this graph shows the frequency of an enormous rainfall in the Japanese meteorological station. The construction was done in 1975, but after 1975, the number of enormous uh, precipitation is increasing. So we are really facing this change in hydrometeorology. So we have to adapt to it. So there are certain changes. One is the hydromet changes. The other is the changes for demand for water. Now, the population growth in Japan is not big than before. Also, the industrial water recycling is much greater. That means that we can recycle the industrial water than before. So that means the curving of the demand. Also, the progress of meteorological observation, the accuracy of typhoon tracking and prediction is much more accurate than 50 years ago. So there are various methods to renovate and uh, make the best use of existing multi-purpose dams. For, for example, you can raise the dam body to increase the volume. You can change the allocation of the dam capacities. You can change uh, new spillways to give more flex flexibility. And also, we, you can make new engineering techniques to control the sediments. So we have practiced these examples. I'm talking about a big dam in the island, big island of Shikoku in Japan. It's called the Sameura Dam. It's the mother, I would say, it's the mother dam of the whole Shikoku island. There are various other dams, but it is in the uh, system uh, controlled by this big Sameura Dam. It's a uh, dam height, it's dam height is 105 meters, and it's a concrete gravity dam. And it was constructed between 1967 to 1975. In 2005, there was a big case of a drought and a flood. In the month of July and August 2005, there was very scarce rain. So the dam was almost empty. But when Typhoon Nabi landed on Japan from 5 September, it brought enormous rainfall by stimulating the rainfall. So this was the picture of 5 September, and this was the picture of 7 September. You can see that the dam storage is full now, after 7 September. And if Sameura Dam's volume for service water capacity was already full before the typhoon coming, it would have overspilled and it would have flooded in a big flood disaster. But thanks to the fact that the dam was empty, it was able to really uh, grasp the enormous rainfall. Now, based on these lessons, we have new solutions. This is the previous allocation of volume for that dam. Uh, in Japan, we have dam volume allocation for flood season and non-flood season. 
And this was the typical previous allocation for flood control, hydroelectricity, service water. Of course, for all dams, we have the dead storage and the sediment storage. Now, by having the changes of the volume, we have decided to allocate a pre-discharge capacity. And for that purpose, we decided to have yield of the hydroelectricity to pre-disaster charge capacity. Also, because of the demand for water is decreasing, the service water baseline is reduced. And also in the flood season, we have two types of volume, ordinary and emergency. Emergency is when a typhoon is approaching. Now, in order to really do that, it was not just enough to just change the allocation. We had to place a new discharge spillway and valve to be placed in lower elevation of the dam body to enable new allocations. And this is the present picture. And we are going to have a new discharge spillway. And this renovation works started from 2018, and it will take 11 years. And there would be certain costs. Now, how can the stakeholders of these multi this multi-purpose dam agree on this renovation? There are many stakeholders for multi-purpose dams. Of course, the original fishing, the irrigation need for the agriculture uh, uh, unions. You need the hydroelectricity for the power plants, tap water for household, industrial water for factories, and of course for flood management, you know. And there are so many stakeholders, and they all have to agree on the financial burden of this renovation work, as also for the division of the operating costs of this multi-purpose dam. So it's not just discussions. It's a very serious and tough negotiation. And everybody has to agree on who pays how much money for the construction, the renovation works, and also the yearly maintenance costs. So it's not just a nice discussion. It's a very serious and fierce, tough negotiation. Let me take you another example. It's a dam which was constructed in year 821. At that time, the Japanese Buddhist priests, they were the best civil engineers in Japan. And a famous Buddhist priest, whose name was Kobo, he made an earth, he reconstructed an existing pond to an irrigation earth dam. And this dam was renovated, then damaged by flooding, repaired, damaged by flooding, repaired, and damaged by earthquake, and reconstructed. And in 1940 was the last renovation and it still works. So this example is a dam which have uh, survived all the changes for the last 1,200 years. So we can, if we can have good technologies and good coordination and good agreement, we can always renovate existing infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Professor. Um, so uh, I'm delighted to introduce my uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan. Uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan is a consultant, researcher, public policy specialist, teacher, columnist, and thought leader. He has delivered over a dozen projects on decarbonization of railways, semi-high-speed rail, metro, road, 
Integrated Mobility, Urban Housing and Public-Private Partnership. He has published over 100 newspaper articles on various aspects of infrastructure, environment and air pollution, public finance, industrial modernization and economic development. He has featured in over 20 TV discussions that focus on infrastructure systems and public policy. And he holds a PhD from the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad in management with specialization on public systems. Mr. Ramakrishnan, over to you. Uh, you're, you're muted, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Richard. So I'm going to give a presentation on uh, aging urban infrastructure in uh, India. Yeah, move to the next slide. So if at all we look at uh, the population of uh, India in urban areas, we can see uh, cities with various uh, populations of more than uh, 30 million, more than 20, more than 10, more than uh, 6.5 million. And then there are many other uh, cities. There are almost 100 cities uh, are, uh, with a population of uh, more than uh, say 0.5 million. So uh, you know it's not just the population. Uh, the urban population in India is also very, very high compared to any other uh, country. You, even if you consider only the urban population of India, it will be equivalent to uh, the population of USA or for that matter, uh, many European countries together. So, and the population in urban areas is also increasing. Uh, has increased from 17% in uh, 1950 to uh, about 35%. And uh, it is expected to increase further in the, I mean, in the subsequent decades. And uh, I mean, there is an advantage and disadvantage. We have our cities are existing for many millenniums and uh, centuries. Some of the cities are as old as uh, 5,000 years old. Some of them were uh, only a few centuries back. So we have both, uh, you know, um, uh, old infrastructure as well as the new infrastructure that needs to be created for uh, the future urban development. Move to the next slide. So there is, because of uh, this background, uh, we have uh, so much uh, pressure on urban infrastructure and uh, people are uh, still moving except during the COVID years uh, where the movement has been reasonably restricted. Otherwise, the urban infrastructure is uh, by and large aging whatever we have and the dilapidated condition and insufficient. And in addition to that, we also need to develop uh, uh, so much new infrastructure uh, for uh, the, uh, the population which got settled in urban areas in the last two decades as well as in the years to come. So the, some of the key issues that uh, pertaining to urban infrastructure in India, are, the first thing is urban mass transit, then housing, especially housing, both for uh, the lower uh, income group as well as even for middle income groups, and then waste management, which is, has become a uh, you know, big headache for uh, the governments, and then drinking water and sewerage, and then managing air pollution and uh, water and, water and uh, land contamination. So there are um, uh, there are many challenges uh, in urban governance in India. Uh, it is not fully developed in the sense we need to strengthen our institutions uh, to carry out um, you know urban planning and urban uh, the execution of the urban planning in a uh, systematic and scientific way. And there is no independence on governance for uh, most of the local bodies because local bodies comes and as the third tier of uh, the governance. The first tier is uh, the central government and the central, I mean, what we call it as the second tier is uh, the state government. And the third tier is the urban uh, government. So the, there is a limited, uh, uh, then a limited access to finance because it has to be supported essentially by the state government and the central government and their own resources of, uh, I mean, their ability to generate uh, resources on their own is very much limited. And uh, by and large, uh, most of the times uh, the, uh, the funding that has been given is spent on public welfare, welfare schemes than on, uh, I mean, developing and maintaining uh, good urban infrastructure. Next slide. And there are, uh, apart from the systemic uh, governance issues, there are uh, many systemic issues. Basically, by and large, uh, uh, except for some cities, uh, are about 30 planned cities in India. Most of the other cities are uh, unplanned, essentially because uh, it has been there for a very long time. And uh, when the city develops, it uh, sprawls into uh, you know outskirts uh, without uh, proper uh, planning. And uh, that is how it has grown as absurdly in uh, many directions. 
and uh, now actually the, as a result the urban planning is more reactive than uh, proactive and once a city has been developed then the infrastructure uh, is being developed so it is the other way around and uh, because of uh, this there is a lot of vulnerabilities risk and uh, disasters for example there is so much another east colonies which are on the um, sides of the river bodies and uh, low lying areas so where uh, the flood can um, uh, you know damage them and uh, then inadequate regulations and implementations that is also causing i mean problem because there is always a demand for regularization of the encroachments and uh, when the encroachers are more in numbers that that also has to be taken into consideration so the, the vicious cycle of unplanned development has been uh, creating uh, a lot of uh, trouble for uh, us but again we are working on that indian uh, government and india is uh, working towards uh, improving the systems the next slide then uh, when we look at the opportunities for urban infrastructure when, when i say opportunities because india is uh, i mean if you look at any infrastructure whether it is urban infrastructure or the overall infrastructure we have infrastructure only for 20 percentage of our uh, what what we need to saturate so there is another 80 percentage of infrastructure needs to be developed in the which is going to be developed in the next 30 years unlike the developing uh, developed countries which have developed their infrastructure uh, i mean long back and uh, their infrastructure is, is becoming aging so our infrastructure is like uh, our population uh, demographic uh, dividend we have more young people so almost 70 percent of our population is less than 30 years old so the same way our uh, infrastructure is also very i mean most of the infrastructure are young only some infrastructure are very old so we can uh, go for uh, land use planning where uh, we will be able to uh, you know create um, uh, uh, urban areas where uh, there are separate allocations for uh, uh, residential then transportation commercial industrial public and uh, semi public uh, purposes and then that also achieves uh, much better uh, 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 you know outcome in terms of uh, environmental conversation conversation then um, um, uh, restrained uh, urban sprawling uh, than uh, going in all directions then they reduce the travel needs because still india uh, do a lot of walk trips and uh, then reduce land use conflict you know how to use the land effectively and then uh, ultimately it will also result in uh, ease of uh, living in the urban areas so we have already have uh, some success stories like town planning scheme that has been uh, uh, done in uh, the state of uh, gujarat where uh, the uh, undeveloped parcel uh, parcel of uh, big parcel of land is being given to the government and the government uh with the support of the stakeholders um, uh, improve it with all the amenities and then give it back to them where uh, they need to for example if a person is holding uh, one unit of land he, he will get back 90 percentage of the land back but the 10 percent will go for uh, amenities purposes so this has been happening in uh, gujarat for a very long time very successfully and uh, this is uh, resulting in minimizing displacement and minimizing legal disputes also next slide then urban water infrastructure uh, this is an area where actually we lack uh, very much because uh, of uh, uh, when unregulated urban development happens a um, lot of water bodies get encroached and uh, they are uh, being occupied for various purposes so as a result the natural course of uh, water uh, is getting affected and uh, that is resulting in floods drought and uh, as well as uh, the contamination then uh, basically some of the most of the uh, urban uh, water urban water infrastructure as well as the general water infrastructure in india are very old we have been because ours is a very long uh, very 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 long civilization so our um, rulers have created a lot of uh, i mean urban what i mean water bodies since 5000 years so we have a lot of water bodies only thing is it has to be maintained so this is the precise age i mean old infrastructure for us not the modern infrastructure and uh, uh, the increasing the capacity and maintaining it as well as uh, retaining the existing um, water bodies has become uh, really a challenge and uh, when it is not maintained what happens uh, the urban uh, agglomerations have to be forced to bring water from uh, i mean outside the cities and which is increasing the cost of uh, water in our city so here also uh, we need to go for uh, long term inclusive planning where uh, um, uh, which will reduce uh, floods and droughts 
as well as avoid contamination. So we have been uh, successful uh, with some um, uh, community participation and uh, public participation, like what we have uh, done in uh, the city of Coimbatore, where some of the um, damage, I mean, some of the uh, water bodies have been uh, recovered and uh, retrieved, and then now it started storing more water uh, compared to a few years back. Next slide. Again, urban mass transit, there is a great opportunity because uh, we are in the process of uh, developing um, MRT, various types of MRT, whether it is metro or whether it is uh, uh, mono or for that matter, uh, bus rapid transit system or regional rail. We are in the process of developing it. Already there are almost 10 to 15 cities are uh, already operating metro and another uh, 25 cities are in the process of uh, you know, constructing metro. So there is a huge opportunity and the government has identified this opportunity and then uh, they are very much uh, working on that. So there are, I mean, we have both positive results as well as uh, negative, uh, I mean, uh, some negative results. We have increased patronage for MRT uh, where many people leave their, um, uh, you know, uh, two wheelers and then uh, cars and then uh, moving towards uh, MRT. And then as a result, it is, uh, uh, it has reduced uh, the pollution. And even, uh, for example, Delhi Metro Rail Corporation has uh, um, got some carbon credits and they have, uh, I mean, uh, encashed that carbon credits. So that is the kind of uh, achievement that uh, it is done. And then it is also resulting in uh, accidents. But the reduction in road congestion has not been happening because India is a growing country and where our traffic has been on the increase. So that is the reason. And then there are many issues that needs to be uh, I mean, sorted out because these are all the systemic issues with reference to urban mass transit. First thing is the urban first and last mile connectivity has to be provided uh, properly, which is a uh, decent thing. And then uh, integrating uh, the MRTS with other existing transport systems. We have buses, we have uh, other uh, modes of uh, transport. So that is all another thing. And then uh, we have to make it also, uh, I mean, uh, disaster resilient and uh, it should be able to fight uh, climate change where the, even if it is heavy rain or uh, some other uh, calamity, natural calamity, our uh, urban transport systems have to uh, bounce back within the short time, uh, um, you know, that is expected. The next slide. The next slide is the way forward. I mean, uh, so we have uh, these, I mean, uh, uh, issues and as well as opportunities, every issue is an opportunity. And uh, we have already uh, started under smart city program and it is in the, in the process and uh, most of the smart city programs is going to get completed in, uh, uh, in uh, the next two years. So which will make uh, the city, I mean, uh, more uh, livable, more, uh, I mean, affordable for all sections of the people. And, uh, you know, everything is being digitized. Uh, so th there actually this uh, urban uh, smart cities program has been there. And then we have also started um, uh, uh, achieving on uh, providing a uh, potable water, uh, tap water for every household, which was not the case earlier. So Jal Shakti has been uh, very successful and it has been um, uh, you know, implemented in various states and various uh, urban areas as well as rural areas. And we are, I mean, most probably it will be achieved in another, uh, I mean, uh, say three, four years. And then metro rail, rapid rail, high speed rail. And we are all uh, in this because basically our idea is that the distance, which is uh, make uh, the, the distance between the various uh, rural and urban areas is uh, making people to move towards urban areas. So we have already overcome the, um, uh, the um, tyranny of uh, uh, communication. We are all, except one, everybody else is uh, here actually on online. Whereas we are unable to overcome the tyranny of the distance. So we are uh, developing all the high-speed uh, tra transport systems, uh, whether it is regional connectivity of uh, AV, I mean, airports where uh, smaller cities also can, people from smaller towns and smaller cities also can fly to larger cities. Then um, all these uh, dedicated freight corridor, regional rail, uh, rapid rail, everything. So all this is actually, I mean, uh, giving a hope that uh, in another uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, the urban infrastructure will be much more uh, manageable than what it is uh, today. So, and also we need to integrate uh, our, uh, this climate and resilience because once we start developing our infrastructure, we need to see that uh, they are all, uh, 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 you know, climate resilient as well as disaster resilient. And we need to go for nature-based solution as, as I have told about uh, Coimbatore uh, River, uh, I mean, Coimbatore um, uh, water body recovery, as well as uh, we need to go, I mean, we need to look for uh, better urban governance and then capacity building, which is uh, uh, reasonably lacking, and as well as the community participation, which is very key for uh, any successful uh, implementation and maintenance of urban infrastructure. 
Yeah. Thank you, then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramakrishnan. So um, before I introduce my next speaker, I'd just like to highlight the opportunity for those online to type questions into the live Q&A box in the um, online uh, system. Uh, so if you have questions starting to emerge, please do uh, add them there. Um, and we'll be coming back to those uh, in due course. So without further ado, though, it's a great pleasure to introduce my next uh, speaker, Dr. Anne Gibbs. Dr. Gibbs is an executive management professional with infrastructure management expertise used to assist communities to improve their quality of life. Anne has worked with a diverse range of communities in both developing and developed nations to find solutions for aging water and waste assets, transport and social infrastructure assets in countries from the UK, Denmark to Russia. She has managed the transition of a water authority in Argentina, municipal engineering for remote and urban communities across Australia, and has undertaken humanitarian engineering assignments in Tanzanian refugee camps and acted as a responder to an Indonesian earthquake zone and supported capacity building in East Timor municipalities. Anne has provided technical and managerial expertise to the CDRI Secretariat as a, a disaster resilient infrastructure project expert. She holds a bachelor in civil engineering, a graduate diploma in municipal engineering and management, and a master's in business administration and a doctorate in business administration. Dr. Gibbs, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Dawson. Although Australia has a, a much smaller population than India and its infrastructure has not been tested beyond 200 years, unlike in Japan, we still share many of the same challenges around ageing infrastructure in the urban environment as just outlined by our past two speakers. In inner cities in developed countries, the built environments already have most of the infrastructure needed, but it's aging. We know that resilient infrastructure can better withstand the extreme events such as flood cyclones and heat stresses. And managing assets well is actually cheaper than building new assets all the time. And we can integrate resilience into existing infrastructure management systems, such as ISO 55001, with great benefits realised. Uh, the 2019 World Bank report says that for every $1 spent in strengthening infrastructure resilience, a $4 benefit is realised in avoided economic and social losses. But we need to look long-term and intergenerational in making our infrastructure resilient. So we're living in a time of big government infrastructure spend around the world with more infrastructure planned to be built in the next 20 years than in the past 200 years. And this is also evident in Victoria, which is the Australian state in which I live. Next slide, please. Is, yet there's a disproportionate amount of attention being provided to new assets with little attention devoted to existing infrastructure assets until they fail to provide the required service or they structurally fail. For instance, when trains start to run late because the rail lines buckle due to excessive heat, people start to notice. So possible reasons for the attention on the new assets is that elected officers like to cut ribbons on new bridges and new hospitals. So ribbon cutting ceremonies for maintenance and rehabilitation works should also be celebrated. And also being able to promote and explain the value to top management who make these decisions to invest the capital maintenance and operations is sometimes difficult. There's no realization that in keeping the performance level, the assets were designed to achieve is actually a good resilience strategy in itself as weak assets in disrepair are unlikely to stand up to the stresses and strains of future weather events, um, future growth and um, traffic demands if, if it's a road. Now, knocking down old assets and building new is not the best way to reach net zero. Construction is a big emitter of carbon and concrete is a widely used material in civil construction works, and which is a high emitter of carbon. And concrete is actually widely used construction material in the world. 
and it's responsible for six to eight percent of global carbon dioxide emissions with Portland cement being the primary ingredient in concrete responsible for the majority of the concrete's carbon emissions. Next slide please. Um, typically not enough funding is provided to operate and maintain the existing infrastructure over its life cycle. So existing infrastructure is left to deteriorate until it is no longer able to perform to its original design level. Maintenance and operation phases of an asset's life cycle typically account for about four fifths of the total cost of the asset over its lifetime. And funding for the life cycle of an asset has not always been provided so many assets are badly in need of repair and then they're not able to withstand the um, weather conditions predicted for the future. And this leads to reactive maintenance, when then, which then leads to a maintenance back backlog, which means you need to find more money. So we have existing infrastructure and the new infrastructure competing for funds. And this infrastructure needs to meet the needs of the community, it needs to be fit for purpose. Next slide, please. It needs to be compatible to its environment, including climate risk and low carbon emissions, and it needs to be cost effective. So it's actually a balance. An infrastructure management systems approach provides opportunity to incorporate resilience into an, the organisation at all levels. Next slide, please. Each level in an organisation requires different information about the organisation's assets in order for decisions to be made and all levels need to work together to ensure the infrastructure is fit for purpose, addresses future demand and continues to provide a service to the community and does so creating minimum emissions. So let's look at an inner city municipality in Melbourne, which has all its infrastructure systems and is looking at the problem of its ageing assets. Next slide, please. Just over a hundred years ago, Eight kilometres of large brick drains were constructed to take the stormwater across the municipality to the creek. On the 6th of January, after a heavy rainfall, a portion of one of these lengths of drain collapsed with a vintage Mercedes car falling in the drain. Miraculously, no one was injured and luckily it was holiday time, so traffic was light. But this is a busy main road with a tram and bus service. And prior to this incident, the condition of the brick drainage system was not known. So CTT, CTV um, cameras were sent down the length of drain to find if there are any blockages or indication of loose bricks or missing mortar or tree root ingress uh, and just obtain a, the general condition of the drains. Now the design loading on these drains hadn't changed significantly over the life, had changed significantly over the dry life of the, the, the drains. Uh, with, there was heavier tra traffic loadings and the pipe bedding had been disturbed with tree roots ingressing in, a, in the pipe bedding and other service pipes were being laid in close proximity to, the, um, to this brick drain. So these factors all combined with the unusually heavy rain and ended in collapse. This particular section of drain was fixed using funds from the reactive maintenance budget. However, there was a high risk that more sections of the old drainage system may also collapse. The funds were not immediately available to strengthen all the sections of the drainage system. So a five year program was developed using a risk based approach to strengthen all of the length of brick drains with sections that had high consequence to public safety if they failed being the first sections to be strengthened, such as sections outside shopping strips or outside schools or along main roads. The method of rehabilitation of the brick drains was to place a sleeve inside the existing drain to provide strengthening. In choosing this rehabilitation and refurbishment option for the brick drain program, there was no need to dig up existing infrastructure and minimum new materials were used in the process. So, in this way, the organisation chose to contribute to transition to its net zero through choice of the rehabilitation method. This occurrence led to better governance of the organisation's infrastructure. An asset management policy was put in place by the council and asset management plans developed for not just these drainage assets, but all 
asset classes with prioritised funding programs to manage and care for the infrastructure in a more systematic way. The Council recognised the need to focus funding on existing infrastructure and their investment portfolio only allowed for 5% of its annual capital expenditure for new infrastructure, while 95% of its capital infrastructure was for renewal or refurbishment of um, infrastructure assets. So in conclusion, it seems to me that it's better to look after your existing infrastructure and see how to make it resilient before opting for building new infrastructure. And it's all a balance of the funds that you've got available, the risks and opportunities that you'd like to look at and the performance that you would like out of the system. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Anne. That's excellent. So um, thank you to all three speakers for uh, uh, keeping on time and providing us with some excellent thoughts. We've heard uh, uh, around some of the challenges our ageing assets are facing in terms of dealing with, for example, too much water or too little water, all within 48 hours. We've heard about the challenges of working in complex, often informal and unplanned urban environments around the need to overhaul a wide range of infrastructure sectors. And we've also heard very similar, I think, uh, messages echoed um, where infrastructure is maybe more established, but limited funds, changing design loads uh, and uh, a dynamic urban environment and, uh, uh, and, and perhaps prioritising new investments pose real challenges uh, elsewhere. Before we move towards a panel discussion, though, I have one more uh, panellist to introduce, Ms. Savina Carluccio. Um, Ms. Carluccio is the Executive Director of the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, ICSI. She's an experienced civil engineer and infrastructure practitioner. She has over 20 years experience advising government, infrastructure owners and operators, multilateral development banks and NGOs to develop and implement sustainable and resilient infrastructure that is fit for the future. She was previously head of guidance and standards at the Resilience Shift, as well as an associate director and infrastructure advisor at Arup. She serves as a member of the Institution of Civil Engineers Advisory Board for the Sustainable Resilient Infrastructure Community. Uh, Ms. Carluccio, I wonder if I could ask you perhaps just for a few immediate reflections on what you've heard so far and maybe a little bit about how, how ICSI is trying to tackle uh, these challenges around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dozen, and uh, thank you for inviting me today. It's an honor to be part of such an esteemed panel today. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to say a few, a few more words about uh, the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, or ICSI, for short. Um, so ICSI was found, founded in, uh, in 2019 by the American Society of Civil Engineers, Resilient Shift, the Global Covenant of Mayors, WSP and was later joined by the Institution of Civil Engineers of founding members. So the organization's mission is to make sustainability and resilience the cornerstone of every infrastructure decision. We echoes nicely the IPCC report that we, we saw before. And, and what we're trying to do is to raise the voice of the engineering community globally to ensure that we've got sustainable and resilient infrastructure now and in the future. And all of our work is action oriented. We do thought leadership, knowledge creation, we do advocacy activities, we track impact of the engineering community through the UNF triple C endorsed race to resilience campaign. And we also deliver uh, demonstration projects on the ground. So back to the panel, this, to, the, to the presentations, and I think it was fascinating to see all the examples and, and the way the challenges and opportunities have been articulated. I think that really brought the, the topic to life. And I think also gave us a bit of a, an idea on a framing of the size and complexity of the challenge that we're dealing with. So we're dealing with systemic issues. We're dealing with aging infrastructure as a chronic stress on our infrastructure systems. 
and MSO are so under investment, lack of maintenance, climate change, loss of biodiversity, they're also stresses. And so suddenly we've got compound, uh, potential for compounded effects and, and we, we got increase and new vulnerabilities and when the disasters strike then the consequences can be really significant so we can't assume i think we we i do agree um with professor, professor nishikawa that there are so existing solutions um available so there are technical technical uh, solutions that are available i also agree that we need to be uh thinking about our existing infrastructure a lot more and we need to look care for it um, but we can't assume that our current practices will be able to cope in, in, in a more complex and uncertain and kind of interconnected risk landscape that we're facing in the future so for me I think you know just a couple of reflections is that how do we prioritize so which ones are the right projects uh, so and because we can't pay to renew, retrofit, or replace all the existing infrastructures and to make it resilient to all hazards. So we need to, and we also need to be mindful of, of selecting low carbon solutions. And so the second point is also how, how do we equip the practitioners to, to do something now about it? Because obviously we can't be waiting for policy to trickle down to practitioners. We can't be sometimes wait for development or update of standards. So it needs to be, the practitioners need to be provided with guidance, with tools, with the, the, something that equips them to take action now. And this is the key role, I think, for organizations such as ICSI or also CDRI, the, the knowledge based organization to, to curate and disseminate guidance and best practice examples, such as the ones that were being introduced today, for example, by Professor Nishikawa, and how we can take action and implement resilience now. So I think I'll stop here for now. Perfect. Thank you very much. So um, just a reminder for those who are online, please do feel free to submit questions through the live Q&A uh, box uh, in the web uh, page. Um, and for uh, those uh, watching in person, um, uh, we'll be coming to uh, the uh, in-room in moderator to uh, perhaps uh, consolidate some, some questions in due course. But please forgive me as, as uh, the, the moderator for perhaps kicking off with the first question. Um, one of the challenges we're discussing and exploring today is um, whether we should refurbish or whether we should replace. Those two options provide both different, uh, I suppose, capabilities in terms of building in resilience or decarbon the level of decarbonisation that could be achieved. But they also come with potentially quite different carbon footprints themselves. We've already heard today um, from uh, Dr Gibbs about the huge uh, CO2 impact of uh, cement. Should we be emphasizing more on building new infrastructures and perhaps trying to deliver more systemic change uh, for a longer term benefits? Or uh, when is uh, refurbishment uh, the better option? And perhaps I could come to uh, my panelists in the uh, order in which we heard from them uh, uh, speaking. So, Professor Nishikawa, do you have any thoughts on this? The uh, when it's most important to refurbish, when it's most important to replace? Ooh, I would say that it's all case by case. That's the reality. And also, I would like to emphasize that, especially regarding infrastructures, the most important thing is agreement among the stakeholders. It's it might be the taxpayers, it might be the elected people, they are the ones who decide. And we have to give good evidence, good information for their better decisions. 
there is no general rule, I would say. Of course, you have to strike the balance between uh, renovating existing infrastructure or making new infrastructure. In some cases, it might be better to just demolish the old existing infrastructure and make new infrastructure. But there's no single choice. It's all case by case. And I would say that uh, in general terms, you can, do, you can say anything. But in reality, if you go to the ground, and especially when civil engineers have to uh, negotiate with the local people on the solutions, it's not just uh, nice, eloquent papers in English. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps, uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan, I'd be interested to hear uh, whether you agree um, uh, that this is case by case, but also perhaps what should we be looking out for, uh, especially in some of the more um, uh, informal, unplanned settlements that you described when we make this decision? What, should, what criteria should we be using to decide whether to refurbish or replace? Thank you. Yeah. So it's, it's a contest specific. Strictly speaking, it's a contest specific. And depending on the contest, uh, whether uh, the infrastructure is old and uh, sturdy and requires uh, smaller maintenance uh, cost as well as uh, you know, other things, then in that case, it is better to, I mean, replenish the existing infrastructure. I'll uh, speak on Indian contest. For example, our water bodies are very old and uh, have been very strong. Uh, some of the dams that were constructed 2,000 years back are still very strong and um, with little maintenance. So on that part, the existing uh, for the, uh, the traditional infrastructure, which has been in good shape, we should not uh, think of uh, doing a new infrastructure. We should try to maintain it and then, um, re I mean, retain it for as many years as possible. Whereas in the case of a new infrastructure, like uh, I say, uh, the transport infrastructure or uh, infrastructure of uh, electricity or, uh, I mean, uh, these things, we need to, or for that matter, urban uh, planning and urban housing, so unoccupied settlements. We need to create a new infrastructure. We can't allow the existing infrastructure to, I mean, uh, happen. For example, unauthorized colonies and other things have created a lot of uh, havoc in the city life. Uh, a section of the population uh, is occupying the unauthorized colonies and it is affecting the entire uh, population and uh, it is creating havoc and uh, floods uh, in the form of floods. So in that case, we need to um, demolish. What I'm saying is we have to uh, completely uh, do away with that and then create a uh, new infrastructure for the people who are affected by this, um, who are, uh, you know, who occupied in the unauthorized uh, colonies and then move with that action. And moreover, the third issue is with reference to uh, utilization of the uh, infrastructure assets. For example, we need to try to, I mean, achieve maximum throughput from every infrastructure, whether it is a water infrastructure or whether it is a transport infrastructure or for that matter, electricity infrastructure, anything for that matter, we need to try to achieve maximum throughput. What I'm saying is, suppose I have, uh, I have constructed a metro, so I need to achieve maximum throughput from uh, that. And uh, by introducing new systems, by introducing by introducing new technical uh, ideas and uh, thereby i need to increase uh, the um, throughput of the system than trying to create uh, you know newer uh, systems uh, to in addition so that is my point. thank you very much um, dr gibbs i was wondering if you had anything to add to uh, these perspectives so far on the the the, the, the sort of decision making criteria around refurbishment or replacement? Yes, well, I could agree that it is on a a case-by-case a, um, case, um, basis. Um, the infrastructure needs to be fit for purpose. And there are, and you do need to just look at the opportunities for repurposing infrastructure um, before you, you just um, make a decision to um, build new infrastructure. And to look at those opportunities for repurposing, you need to have some good data available. So it needs to be evidence-based, uh, whichever decision that you make. Um, but 
for instance, there are lots of opportunities with um, municipal buildings where the usage, once you find, if you look at the data, you can find that the, the usage hasn't been um, for the, the purpose that the building was originally uh, designed for, and there's opportunities to make better use of it. So I think that there's quite a lot of hidden gems in the existing infrastructure if you go looking for it and you have the data. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Carluccio, do you have anything to add on this? And, and perhaps what role might um, ICSI and other kind of organisations with that global reach have in, in terms of helping to build capacity and new ways of thinking uh, around refurbishment versus uh, replacements? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I would add that um, one of the criteria might also be the importance of uh, the critical service that infrastructure provides. So, um, and that might impact, you know, the level of investment uh, you want to put into replacing the infrastructure. Um, the other, the other point I wanted to make is that repurposing and then kind of expanding on the repurposing, but also kind of using circular economy principles, so circularities, to um, to lower the emissions of uh, when we are renewing. So that's something else that we should be considering. And because this is a there's a movement around circular economy that is happening now, and I see that there are synergies with resilience and sustainability and low carbon. So I think, you know, that should be brought in the picture. And, and in terms of um, uh, the strategy or the approach, definitely case by case. And I think it's always going to be a mix of approaches. And so from no regrets, it's obviously the most um, costly and maybe carbon intensive to maintenance. So I know, I know maintenance doesn't sound very sexy, but good maintenance in the risk-based uh, prioritized maintenance as I, I, Dr. Gibbs was saying, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good solution. Uh, and adapt, uh, adaptive pathways, that's another thing, isn't it? You know, like, so we intervene, but we intervene uh, using science and projections and understanding, you know, what, when and what. We need to choose from that menu of interventions. So I think it's a mix of strategies that we, we need to consider. And then in terms of capacity building, I think organizations like ICSI and, and CDRI I do have that role to play in capacity building uh, for practitioners because not all practitioners, although practitioners, uh, speaking for engineers now, uh, they do have te deep technical knowledge. Uh, so we do, but not all engineers are literate in resilience. It's in order how to apply resilience uh, principles or concepts because risk management, the traditional risk management is no longer fit for purpose. We just need to um, expand that to, 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 to just take into account interconnected risks, for example, and scenario planning and things that are not done routinely uh, when we apply risk management. So as organizations such as CDRI and ICSI can really play a role in delivering that sort of capacity building for the engineering community, but also for other stakeholders uh, uh, that are involved in infrastructure development, because each one of us has a role to play and a shared responsibility. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we're hearing some uh, clear and consistent messages here uh, about the need to, to take each uh, project at, at its merits and, and think on a case by case basis and a number of very useful pointers towards key criteria to think about. Now, one thing that I picked up on um, was uh, the importance of community engagement. I think a couple of you have touched upon this. Um, I'd be keen to hear more about uh, how we go about engaging communities and ensuring that they have a, a voice uh, in shaping the future of their infrastructure, whether that is down a kind of a more replacement, refurbishment route, and at what sort of scale these conversations need to happen. Is this very local? Is this citywide or maybe even national conversations? So perhaps, um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ramakrishnan, if you don't mind me coming to you first as an experienced um, 
uh, 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 public communicator in this? How, how do we go about it engaging more widely? So I would always uh, prefer uh, a local or uh, city-based uh, conversation more than uh, the national level conversation. Because each city or each urban area is uh, unique in its, uh, I mean, uh, in its uh, issues. And uh, generalizing it uh, for uh, the national level uh, may not be a good idea. So community participation at the, preferably at the local level and the city level is the first step. And when success stories emerge from one uh, urban area or urban agglomeration, many other uh, would uh, try to, I mean, uh, follow that and then uh, try to learn and from, uh, you know, adopt uh, based on their uh, requirements than uh, trying to impose it at uh, you know, national level. So, for example, the success story of Coimbatore where uh, the water bodies have been, uh, uh, you know, retrieved, recovered uh, from the encroachments and then uh, water started uh, um, storing there is a good example uh, for other uh, municipal, uh, I mean, uh, corporations to emulate and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, then in that case, you know, that will be a good idea. You have to start with the smaller scale and then uh, it will uh, it will have an avalanche effect. So that is uh, my, uh, you know, understanding. Thank you. Would any of my other panelists like to come in on this? Do Dr. Gibbs, and then perhaps over to Professor Nishikawa after that. Okay. Yes, look, I agree that, thank you. I agree that it is, uh, the, the local level is where you're best to have the community consultation and those conversations because it's the residents in that immediate area that are going to be using those services. And in my experience, uh, the residents are very uh, vocal about what they want and what kind of service level they want. So what they want to see out of their um, assets. So I agree with the local level. Thank you. Professor Nishikawa. Yes. I would also emphasize that it depends on the, the, the infrastructure. For example, the case of the dam, when the reconstruction works would be uh, conducted, it would reflect on the water bills of the city of, let's say, Kagawa, city of Kochi, etc., etc. So the city authorities have to be the first ones to be consulted. Also, the irrigation water, the agricultural union they have to pay for the bills also for the electricity the shikoku power plant company have to pay the bills so in the case of this multi-purpose dam i would say it starts with the city level it depends on the infrastructure if it's a uh, national highway maybe it should start at the national level but if it is a uh, uh, remodeling of a sewerage system, maybe used to start at the community level because it's regarding the uh, flood, the the local flooding, or the local sewerage system. So, depending on the scale of service of that infrastructure, uh, the level of participation, either at the community level or the city level or at the state level or even at the uh, bigger. Um, mega, mega metropolitan level, uh, it differs. But the important thing is to have the stakeholders to get accurate information, evidence, so that they can have proper understanding and proper agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kaluccia, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, maybe one one thing I would add is that um, the role of uh, of users and the community uh, in ensuring that the infrastructure that then gets delivered is is more resilient. Because if they've been part of the they participated into the into the planning and and you know consultation processes and they're part of um, the development of the infrastructure they will be using, um, they're also more likely to know. Um, you know, how from the community, uh, from their behavior, how to best react if the infrastructure is um, stressed, you know, like so in time of, uh, you know, like um, 
yeah, it, it, adverse events, flooding, etc. So I think you know, like the community and the users do play an important role in uh, in infrastructure, uh, and we should be. Um, in interfacing and interacting with them, not just during the development of it, but also uh, keep them informed on how they can best use it and increase the resilience of it. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so we've got uh, an excellent question from the audience, and this is just a reminder for those of you watching online, there is a Q&A box that you can um, put your questions in as well. But I've got a question from Avinash um, and, uh, they're asking that in the context of energy infrastructure, there's a current emphasis on hydrogen and development and deployment of new forms of energy generation to achieve net zero. So what does that mean for the future of our existing infrastructure that has been based and based on and built around natural gas and petroleum? Um, I'm guessing we're, we're talking here not not just around our industry, but also um, uh, giant pipes that move oil and gas and, and other fuels around. Does anyone like to come in with this first of all? Shall I? Yes, please. Yeah. So as far as, I mean, again, I'm speaking only from India specific uh, point. So uh, for, at the world level, it's a different story because uh, they are changing from uh, trans the transition is from one uh, form of energy to another uh, form of energy. So they need to, I mean, um, uh, replace or abandon the existing, um, uh, I mean, uh, energy infrastructure, whatever it may be, it's a thermal power plant or whatever it may be, and then move towards uh, solar plant and then more uh, less fossil fuel dependent uh, plants. Whereas in India, we have a different story because our uh, energy demands are uh, not uh, even met and uh, it is to be met. Uh, the energy demand for us is almost uh, in the next 20 years, it will be around uh, four or five times that of what we are consuming right now. So it's a developing uh, you know, and uh, economy. So what we can do is in India, as far as India is concerned, we can retain the old plants. And then uh, when the plant uh, life uh, ends, or when they become uh, unmanageable due to environmental uh, pollution that it creates, they have to be wound up. And then the new infrastructure is anyhow is going to come up uh, in the form of uh, non-fossil fuel, like uh, you know solar and uh, wind and uh, so many other things. And that has to be boosted. Uh, I mean, uh, in the next uh, uh, years. So the contest is different for India or any developing country and for a developed developed country. For developed country, uh, it, it has to be uh, the, you know slowly replacing the uh, less, uh, I mean, more polluting uh, fossil fuel plants and then uh, moving towards um, uh, less polluting uh, uh, non-fossil fuel plants. Again, uh, the panelists may differ from me. I would like to, I mean, listen to them. Thank you. Um, I don't, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we've got too many uh, petroleum expertise on, but I'd be keen to hear perhaps, um, Dr. Gibbs, are there opportunities for refurbishing some of these infrastructures? Can we do something with the existing pipes and, and, and wires and so on that maybe, maybe could t turn how they're used? Um, yes, look, there, there um, will be innovations that uh, you can do, that you can use to do that. Um, the Latrobe Valley in Victoria has shut one of its power stations. And so this brings um, like a new set of issues. There's um, particularly, with, there's a large portion of the community that lives in the Latrobe Valley that were workers at that power station. So the area desperately needed to find alternative employment um, opportunities for the area. Um, so, however, there was renewable energy that was being developed at the site um, with a big, a large solar plant being put there. And people in the area were retrained uh, into the renewable energy industry. And that area, that land area, was uh, redesigned to take the um, solar um, panels. So some assets um, are not going to be required anymore. And, and some are going to become stranded. Um, although we can look for alternative uses um, and, and particularly around buildings 
um, buildings rather than knocking them down, we can look for reuses for those type of assets. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Coluccio, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I think I think what I want to flag there is uh, obviously this is one of the key transition risks, isn't it? it so we, we know that there is like a high dependency on uh, energy. Uh, we know that this transition will not happen overnight. Uh, and we also know that there will be competing demands on the energy. Um, for example, with the introduction of with uh, connected uh, and autonomous vehicles. And, uh, and so we, we will just, um, I, think, I think it is right to, to think about this um, as a solution. It's just, you know, I, I would be concerned that um, sometimes what is overlooked is the time that will take us to get there in terms of building the infrastructure that we need or upgrading. Uh, perhaps Professor Dawson, I mean, you, you probably, you know, you would, uh, you would uh, have similar views potentially on, you know, electrification of vehicles, you know, like it sounds like a panacea of solutions, but actually it's not. Um, uh, and so, I mean, definitely moving towards renewable and, and kind of um, hydrogen sounds like a great idea. It's just, you know, like the move is not going to be fast and it's going to be pretty, pretty um, there's going to be a transition that needs to be managed and, and people need to kind of have an increased awareness on how um, the energy demand will be managed, um, production and, and, uh, and demand. So that, that's kind of uh, a flags to me that... Um, we do need to take that systemic view and we need to be more conscious uh, of interdependencies of leverage points in the system. All things that um, might sound a bit theoretical, but then when you look at the practical case, um, very quickly you understand you know, that, that where, where things are, are, are going to fall down. Yes, excellent. And I, I do agree with that. Um, uh, so we have, uh, uh, the, this is the joy of our hybrid events. Uh, we've had some questions coming through online, but uh, we also have a question live uh, from uh, the in-person end of this event. So perhaps over to the studio. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dawson. Uh, I'm John Carstensen from uh, Mott McDonnell, a global engineering advisory and uh, development uh, uh, business. Um, it, it strikes me that this very interesting conversation has been very focused uh, about the, uh, the infrastructure uh, itself. And um, we heard in the morning about the importance of getting into a people-focused um, uh, transition uh, around infrastructure. Um, I would love to hear the, the panel's reflections on what would be the best way to ensure that people-centered uh, point of departure uh, for, uh, for these conversations about uh, infrastructure choices. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John. And perhaps we could stay in the studio and ask uh, Professor Nishikawa to uh, pick up on that one first, if that's OK. OK. Thank you for the question. And let's question, why was that infrastructure first constructed for? For the people, isn't it? So what is important is that when we are discussing about maybe refurbishing, renovation, or demolishing, we have to inform the recipient, the people, regarding what is behind this new move. Now, it, you have to give information about the cost, the negative consequences, the positive consequences, and that is so important. And in a democratic society, that is the basis for any discussion. But you have to bear in mind that it's not easy to reach an agreement. You need to be very conscious, and you have to spend hours and days and years of discussion. But unless you do that, unless you do that, you would not get 
a people-centered solution. That's all I can say from my real experience of negotiating with various cities, agriculture unions, hydroelectricity power companies, the fisheries uh, unions regarding their pros and cons of a reconstruction of them. Thank you. Could, would, uh, Professor Dawson, would you, would you allow me a, a, a sort of comment back on, on that? Uh, I mean, thank you very much for, uh, for that reply. But it sort of also implied that um, the people-centered part is about informing people about infrastructure choices that are imposed on, on them. How do we move beyond that and get a genuine consultation about those infrastructure choices and the various decisions that may need to be made uh, when we are talking about replacing, refurbishing, whatever. I mean, it becomes very, very important when you're looking at some of the, um, uh, some of the decisions that have to be made uh, around uh, low carbon infrastructure. Um, some people regard, regard wind turbines as eyesores. I'm thinking about a current debate in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and um, uh, others believe that, yeah, you, you should be able to uh, accept that if you want the energy. But that is actually about a conversation that starts before the choices of the infrastructures, uh, uh, the various infrastructure assets are, are made. And I'm, I'm just keen to, uh, to hear ideas about how can we move beyond the, yes, we've got to inform people over to, uh, you actually start with the desire, the interests of people. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Gibbs, would you mind if I came to you and, and, and ask you, you've, you've worked in a number of parts of the world in different contexts. Any thoughts on how we, we do this differently? Move from just informing people to actually uh, really involving them in, in the, think, the thought process? Yes, well, it's actually the, um, the lo at the local government level where you have the ability to, um, to talk with the local people and um, it's the, the local people's rates that are going to pay for the infrastructure. So um, building the um, infrastructure that they want is pretty important. So it actually, the whole process starts with the stakeholder engagement. Um, I know it does in the inner city uh, Melbourne uh, where we, um, if we're going to change anything, it starts with stakeholder consultation. Um, so that can be things, you know, like letter drops, um, getting people to public meetings, um, finding out what people want. And um, then there's the, the, the decision is made at the council, with, amongst the councillors um, to go forward or not go forward. Um, the uh, engineers and technical people can bring um, technical evidence, but it's at, it's at the end of the day, what needs to be built is what the people want. Thank you, Mr. Ramakrishnan. Um, you've obviously worked in slightly different contexts. I mean, does the same apply in informal um, settlements as well? It will not apply. Because people will not uh, be ready to leave the in-situ, uh, I mean, uh, places where they have occupied uh, illegally. So that won't happen. Even otherwise, uh, my sense is that community participation is very vital for any um, infrastructure uh, development or uh, uh, refurbishing or uh, replacing the existing infrastructure. So there is no second thought about it. But we have to remember that there are different stakeholders uh, with a different uh, interest uh, in any community. Community is not single monolith. Okay, so what happens is people will have a different, uh, there will be conflict of interest. So when there is a conflict of interest, people will give uh, different uh, preferences based on their, uh, I mean, um, likes and dislikes, based on their, uh, how their livelihood will affect or does not affect. 
and uh, uh, all have to be taken into consideration all have to be studied and uh, all should be given an opportunity to raise their voice and uh, all should be heard but ultimately the decisions have to be taken uh, by uh, the experts or uh, the people i mean the uh, those who are in power uh, in the interest of the larger good of the urban agglomeration that's the point larger good is the ultimate thing again larger good will differ from one uh, uh, period of time to another period of time so it was expected that uh, building uh, flyovers is the best solution for urban traffic uh, uh, congestion removal but now then they have realized that uh, that will add more and more uh, congestion because people when they see that there are more bridges there are more uh, flyovers uh, coming up in uh, city people buy more cars and then they will start using more cars and uh, on the very first day of uh, using uh, the flyovers it's congested so then they realize that okay this is not a solution mass rapid transit system is a better solution so so i mean so it has to be seen in the larger uh, context and in the long term uh, view then uh, and the stakeholders opinions have to be heard and then it has to be considered Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got time for one more question. I'm going back to the audience uh, in the, 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 the in-person venue. Hi everyone, my name is Nivya. So in this presentation, uh, Dr. Ann has mentioned that 80% of the uh, total cost is spent in, uh, is in maintenance and operation. And also Ms. Savina also mentioned that uh, risk-based good Uh, maintenance is crucial so my question is how can we ensure this maintenance of the infrastructure throughout its life life cycle because we know when we are building an infrastructure the major investment is made in the initial development of the infrastructure and a, a very small share is kept for maintenance so how can we ensure this maintenance of infrastructure is it through the community or the user uh, maintaining the infrastructure or is it is it through channelizing more funds for Uh, maintenance of the infrastructure so what are the best ways or how can we ensure this maintenance thank you thank you very much uh, ms kaluche perhaps i could come to you first and then ask dr gibbs to come in with some further thoughts yeah uh thank you for the question so my view is that um maintenance needs to be uh, needs to be properly funded and um and opex we know the, the is not sufficient generally um because you know people forget uh, that the long um life span of infrastructure actually happens at operation and maintenance stage and therefore you know you need a, a substantial maintenance budget to keep the infrastructure running um at the level of service that you need so um so i think you know there needs to be this uh, knowledge and change of you know we were thinking about uh, we need to change our thinking so we need to start um when we develop um when we do the the planning you know the governments do you know funding you know allocate funding for infrastructure you know there needs to be a lot more awareness on the maintenance needs and therefore you know a more a bigger funding allocated to that um and also i'm thinking about um how climate change you know obviously puts a strain in the long life cycle of our infrastructure in the operation and maintenance phase uh, and um and how perhaps uh, solutions where you go for a ppp arrangement for a shared ownership of infrastructure then allows Uh, and and you go into this type of arrangements and financial arrangements with your eyes open knowing that there is need going to be an increased need for maintenance uh, because of the climate change impacts then uh, then that's where is going to be properly funded uh, but but that needs to needs to come into into the cycle this is one of the things that i think you know needs to happen and quite quickly thank you very much dr gibbs Yes, look, I agree with all those points. Um, I think the only way to do it is to make people more aware that um, your decisions that you make right up front um, when you renew or when you build new infrastructure, you've actually then set your maintenance regime for the lifespan of that asset, and you know how much money you're going to need um, for how many years of the design life. So that just needs to be. Um, 
up front and centre. Um, but uh, because some of the infrastructure is a long life, um, even outliving people, um, there is a, a tendency not to put that maintenance money aside and the temptation to use it for something else. Um, and the same thing will happen with building resilience into existing um, infrastructure, as the past speaker just said. Um, so those two things, maintenance, you know, putting money in for maintenance and putting money in for resilience, is um, it is a big issue that um, we need to solve. That is fantastic. Thank you very much. So we've come to the end of our time. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I certainly had many more questions up my sleeve that I would have been keen to explore, but we, we, we don't have uh, time to do that. However, I would like to, uh, I suppose, uh, make a, 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 a recognition, acknowledgement of the important role of CDRI as a partnership of governments, UN agencies and programmes, multilateral development banks, private sector and other knowledge institutions um, in promoting the resilience of both new and existing infrastructure systems and helping us uh, um, adapt and prepare for future climates. I think these sorts of global networks, sharing knowledge and expertise as we have done today from different parts of, of the world are gonna be absolutely crucial to build our collective capacity and ensure a more resilient infrastructure future. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our hosts, but also our, our wonderful speakers who put a lot of thought into some really inspiring and interesting presentations, uh, and also taking the time to answer a lot of difficult cross-cutting questions uh, that I'm sure we will reflect on for, for, for um, uh, weeks to come. So, Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, and uh, wherever you are in the world, um, uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, good day uh, or good night. Thank you.